It is now time for a question period. The member, the leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is uh, to the Premier. Um, Premier, we've lost to 300,000 well-paying manufacturing jobs under the McGuinty Wynn governments. And this past week, uh, not only Leamington, Southwest Ontario, the entire province was devastated by the news that uh, almost 800 jobs, direct jobs, will be leaving as Heinz shuts down that plant. In short, Heinz ketchup will no longer be made uh, in the province of Ontario, tossing 800 families out of a livelihood. Um, I need to ask you, in light of the job losses in manufacturing and the latest in Leamington with Heinz, do you still believe that the erosion of the manufacturing sector in Ontario is a myth? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, my, my thoughts, first of all, are with the, uh, the workers and the families of the uh, people at the Heinz uh, plant, Mr. Speaker. It's, uh, it's obviously of great concern, and it's very disappointing that this decision has been made. But I want, I want the Leader of the Opposition and uh, people of Ontario to know that um, we, in connected with Heinz, that we did everything we could to, uh, to make sure we understood what the uh, basis of the decision was, Mr. Speaker, and to try to intervene. On September 12th, Mr. Speaker, I called Mr. Brian Arbeek, who's the Managing Director for Heinz Canada, to discuss the potential implications of uh, possible job cuts. We weren't sure exactly what was happening, Mr. Speaker, and that discussion focused particularly on the federal initiative to remove Canadian food packaging standards, and I wanted to know from Mr. Arbeek yes, whether that was a factor in the decision, Mr. Speaker. We followed up October 31st, November 5th, November 8th, November 11th. So, Mr. Speaker, we worked very hard to make sure we understood Thank why you. and if this. Thank you. Supplementary. You know, it's a disturbing answer from the Premier, who just doesn't seem to, to grasp the enormity of the impact of lost manufacturing jobs in Leamington, in Niagara, Hamilton, in eastern Ontario. You don't seem to understand that it's been a decade of policies that have increased hydro rates now among the most expensive in North America, have layered on more and more red tape and bureaucracy that's slowing business decisions down. It's been an increase in, in taxes. Um, Premier, since you have assumed the office of Premier of the Province of Ontario, we've lost 38,000 well-paying manufacturing jobs in the province alone. Isn't this a wake-up call to you? Doesn't this tell you that you've done something wrong when it comes to managing our economy? Isn't it time to go down a very different path? How many more manufacturing jobs like Heinz are we going to lose before you get a wake-up call and try part of our fight? What we know is that since the economic downturn, we have uh, we have. Re uh, we have drawn in and create there have been over 400,000 jobs created mr. speaker so we have more than replaced the jobs that were lost as a result of the economic downturn I have never said mr. speaker that there aren't changes in the manufacturing sector there absolutely are changes in the manufacturing sector mr. speaker we are moving to a, an era of advanced manufacturing some of the issues that we're addressing with our youth job strategy have to do with making sure that young people have the skills that they need in order to be able to take part in the new the new manufacturing sector mr. speaker but the the purpose of my answer was to make sure that people understand that in this particular instance, Mr. Speaker, and in all of these specific instances, we are doing what we can to make sure that yes, we keep those jobs, Mr. Speaker. I had a long conversation with the, uh, the mayor of Leamington on Saturday morning, Mr. Speaker. We are on the ground working with the workers, and my hope Thank is you. that we'll be able to find some solutions. Order. <laughs> Supplementary. Final. I think the Premier's answers are um, insightful in the way she thinks about these issues and how we would take a very different path. She seems to think these things just happen, that they're the result of some circumstances beyond her control. You use the term that the decision was made. Uh, Premier, we have brought forward in this House hundreds and hundreds of times the evidence that run out of, out of control hydro rates are closing down the manufacturing sector, outdated labour laws, high taxes, more and more red tape. From the provincial government, I worry that your ideology blinds you to the need to take a different path when it comes to our economy, to opening up our province for investment. My team and I, we have a turnaround plan for the province of Ontario, one that will say jobs will come first in our province again, one that says that Ontario can lead. I have a vision of an Ontario that makes things for sale across the world, that actually rebuilds and strengthens our middle class with more advanced manufacturing jobs. 
Don't you seem to understand Question. that as a result of decades of liberal decisions that have caused us to become competitive at the bottom of the list, our plan to put us at the top of the list. Why don't you take some Thank of our you. ideas and bring good jobs back to the province? Thank you. Thank you. You said it first. You said it first. Thank you, Premier. The, the ideology that blinds is the ideology that would take us to the bottom of the pack, would fire people across the province, Mr. Speaker, and would drive us down, Mr. Speaker, would not invest in the skills and in the people that we know, Mr. Speaker, are going to take this, are going to take this province forward. I spent time in Waterloo on the weekend, Mr. S uh, Mr. Speaker, and what we know is that investment in our skills, investment in our innovation is what is going to make us strong. I am absolutely not happy that there are manufacturing jobs that have been lost, Mr. Speaker. But what I know is that there are more jobs coming to the province, Mr. Speaker. There is an outflow of jobs and there is an inflow of jobs, Mr. Speaker. But firing people and racing to the bottom is not going to get us where we want to go, Mr. Speaker. Member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. New question, Leader. The, the, the problem you understand, Premier, is that for the 800 men and women who lost their jobs at Heinz, they have hit bottom. They've hit rock bottom, and we've seen the same thing with um, Vicks Pickles in in Dunville, Red Path Sugar uh, in Niagara Falls. Uh, we've seen the same thing with Cangro, the food processing sector is emptying out because of high hydro rates, runaway red tape, outdated laws in our province. It was devastating news, and it should have been a clarion call to you when U.S. Steel Stelco said they no longer make steel uh, in, the, in the city of Hamilton. So let me ask you this. Y you say your solution is actually to do more of the same, effectively to spend Order. money on a deficit and tax away to prosperity. Those are ideas that the NDP drove us into the ditch, and you're going to drive us into a deeper ditch. So what are you prepared to change? Are you going to get hydro rates down? Are you going to clear out the College of Trades so we can actually attract more Question. people to the trades and put them to jobs? I and mean, what option are you going to take from our plan will actually bring jobs back to our province and Real restore jobs. hope for those who are losing hope? Because your plan has taken us Thank to rock bottom as it is. <laughs> Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I would suggest that the Leader of the Opposition speak with the Ontario Food Processors and go to Conestoga College and look at the technology, Mr. Speaker, that is being used to train young people. And I am absolutely convinced that we have a bright future in food processing in Ontario. It's true, Mr. Speaker, that the technology in some of the plants has to be changed. It's true that there have to be investments in order for advanced manufacturing to take off, Mr. Speaker. And it's true that we need to make sure that young people in this province understand what the possibilities are and understand how the businesses in this province can include food processing. So I am absolutely committed to working with the food processing industry. I am very disappointed about the Heinz situation, Mr. Speaker, but Member that does not mean that we're going to throw order. up our hands and say that the people who worked in that factory, A, will never have a job again, because I don't believe that, Mr. Speaker. I believe Answer. that there, there are many possibilities, and we're going to work with the community to make sure that we realize those possibilities. Um, as I've said many times, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't doubt the Premier's sincerity. I do believe you are committed. The problem is that you have no clue on how to turn our economy around. You, you don't seem to grasp that high energy rates are devastating the manufacturing sector in our province. You don't have, seem to understand how more and more laws that you move through the Assembly are putting a bigger red tape burden on our province. I've got a plan to get energy rates under control by stopping your runaway spending with the feed-in tariff program. That's driving up our rates. It's dividing communities. I have a plan to shut down the College of Trades because that's a new barrier to new job creation in our province. I have a plan to lower taxes, one to get spending under control. In short, we have a plan to turn Ontario around, a turnaround plan for the province. The Speaker, with all due respect to the Premier, we don't need 10 months of a group hug. We need a turnaround plan to put people back into jobs and not put us back into Thank you, Premier. Economic Development, Trade and Employment. 
in terms of economic trade, development, and employment. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can't believe what I'm hearing from the leader of the official opposition talking about supporting manufacturing when one of the most important funds that we set up to help manufacturers in southwestern Ontario, the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, which together with the Eastern Ontario Development Fund have created or retained more than 22,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker, 88%. The members on this side are not helping either. Member from Carry on. One of the most important funds for our manufacturers and to expand it that was passed by this government a year ago. And your you member from Mr. Renfrew come to order. Leader of the opposition, and your party voted against that fund. So, Mr. Speaker, when, we're not going to take lessons from that party when it comes to supporting our manufacturers. There are nearly 800,000 people Answer. working in that sector in the province, and we support all of them. Your final supplementary. The uh, Minister of Economic Development and, and Trade says he can't believe what he's hearing from the opposition benches. I, I know the truth hurts, but more importantly, it, it hurts an awful order. lot. The 800 families who are now out of work. Minister of Transportation, back, come to order. A short while ago, closed down their doors. It, it should be an alarm held to all of us that U.S. Steel Stelco will no longer make steel in the province of Ontario. I mean, what, what has to grab you folks by the lapels and, and, and shake you the reality that your plan isn't working? And I. I I'm disturbed to the Premier, actually, and I've asked her a few times what's going to be different. She's not answering and refers the question. So yes. let me ask you this. In your economic statement you put out last week, your only plan was to spend your way to prosperity. You think by borrowing more money from overseas lenders and racking up debt is somehow going to turn things around. So I'll ask the Premier back from her economics philosophy here. Question. Could you please tell us, give us a jurisdiction where they actually spend their way out of deficit and tax way to prosperity? Thank well, it's, under, it's understandable, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the official opposition would tr try to turn the question away from their lack of support for manufacturers and their lack of support of the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund. So we're very disappointed. I'm very disappointed in the decision by Heinz last week to close that factory. I talked with the, as the Premier did, with the, the local mayor, and we, I also talked with the local MPP as well. We have instructed my officials. In fact, the officials from the training colleges and university have also reached out and spoken with the union that represents the workers at that important factory. I've instructed my officials to go to Leamington this week to meet with local leadership to work to look at all possible options. Yeah. Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, the possibility of repurposing the plant and keeping those employers, employees working. And, look at, and I've also said we have an important communities and transition Answer. fund that we're making available to the community to help them through this difficult time. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontario is still above the national average when it comes to unemployment, and more than half a million Ontarians are wondering how they'll make ends meet. In the fall economic statement, the government announced plans to study some targeted tax measures to reward companies when they put people to work or invest in Ontario. Can the Premier tell Ontarians when, if ever, these plans will see the light of day? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we've been we've been clear that that's work that the uh, Ministry of Finance is doing right now. We said that we were going to do that when we uh, announced our budget in uh, last year. Uh, just this past year, and we reaffirmed that in the fall economic statement, which, as you know, was an update. That work is ongoing, and uh, we will be uh, will be moving to uh, to make those changes in the within the next few months. Supplementary. If your people have watched as their bills go up and their paychecks go down, it's time to get the cost of living under control in this province. But the only thing the premier announced to make life more affordable uh, is that the cost for drive clean would come down. Will the premier tell Ontarians uh, how much drive clean fees will be coming down? And when, if ever, they can see a bit of relief. So, Mr. Speaker, again, these are these are issues that we are working on, and we will be uh, we will be making those announcements in due course. In the meantime, Mr. Speaker, uh, I would hope that both the the leader of the third party and the leader of the opposition would work with us to get the Small Business Supports Act, uh, the Small Business Act passed, Mr. Speaker, by the end of December, because that is, a, that is a piece of legislation that actually will help small business, will allow the small businesses to create more jobs, and it, we need to get that through the legislature, through the committee, and back into the House, Mr. Speaker. So I hope that the leader of the third party will work with us on that bill. Thank you. Final supplementary. 
Speaker, the fall economic statement says that people will have to wait for relief on drive clean costs, but it sounds like education property taxes will be going up. Yep. So the Premier won't tell Ontarians when they can see some relief on drive clean costs. Can she tell them if the costs of their education property taxes will be going up and when might that happen, Speaker? Premier. Again, Mr. Speaker, I hope that the leader of the third party will support a targeted tax measure, which is in the Small Businesses Act, that will help small businesses, will reduce their payroll taxes, and will give them some relief. I hope that the leader of the third party will do that, Mr. Speaker. What we said in our fall economic statement was that we were going to be looking at other measures, Mr. Speaker, because the reality is that we are going to stay on target to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18, and, Mr. Speaker, we have to look at ways of making sure that all of the supports that we have in place are rational, that they make sense, and where we need to change them, we need to change them, Mr. Speaker. And so the leader of the third party has identified one issue that was raised by Mr. Drummond. It's something that we need to look Answer. at in the context of a number of other measures, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, leader Speaker, of the third party. Perhaps the Premier should tell her members to stop filibustering the General Government Committee and we'll actually get somewhere on that legislation. A lot of families are wondering how they're going to be able to afford to retire. And while the government's committed to forging ahead with PRPPs that will create a healthy windfall for big Bay Street firms, Speaker, uh, people are hoping for a, an affordable public retirement plan, and they're getting nothing more than promises and endless conversation. The Premier has made a commitment to help Bay Street firms. When will she make a commitment to help everyday families, Speaker? Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I think that the leader of the third party may be uh, referring to the discussion about uh, the Canadian pension plan enhancement that uh, that is being discussed across the country. And the leader of the third party will know that it was our government that ta has been talking about this for a number of years, Mr. Speaker. The former finance minister raised this issue, talked about it across the uh, the country, raised it with the federal finance minister. The federal finance minister seems to have backed off, Mr. Speaker. But we are pushing this issue, and I raised it with my colleagues at the, at the meeting of Canada's Premiers just last week, Mr. Speaker, and my hope is that we will be able to come to some consensus. The Minister of Finance has been able to come to some consensus with his colleagues about some principles upon which we think that the, the CPP should be enhanced. My hope is we'll be able Answer. to take it to the next step with the agreement of the Federal Finance Minister, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I think Ontario families are getting pretty concerned. Yep. They want to see action that will create new jobs. The government promises study. They want to see action that will make life more affordable. The government muses about a property tax increase and can't even commit to cutting fees at Drive Clean. They want to see change, and instead they're getting panels, promises, and a lot more of the same. Why should people believe the Premier when all she offers is endless conversation? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's just talk about what's happening. The youth job strategy, Mr. Speaker, already thir over 3,000 young people, Mr. Speaker, have been placed in jobs as a result of the youth job strategy. And that's the youth job strategy that we put in place, Mr. Speaker, and that we are implementing. Full day kindergarten, Mr. Speaker, the 30% off tuition grant, Mr. Speaker, the uh, investment of, of $35 billion over the next three years. So the leader of the third party can can fabricate a narrative, Mr. Speaker, about I'm going to withdraw that before you even stand up. <laughs> I'm just going to change. Let's, let's do it officially. Withdraw, please. Withdraw. The leader, of the, the leader of the third party, Mr. Speaker, can uh, can uh, create a narrative about what is or is not happening. What I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, is we've got programs in place that are helping people to get skills training that they need. We've got programs in place that are building, invest, investing in infrastructure across this province, Mr. Speaker. And we know yes, that that's what communities need in order to be able to thrive. New final supplementary. Speaker, the families who make Ontario work are worried about jobs for them and their kids. They're worried about the future and whether they're going to be able to retire. And they've worried, they're worried about the fact that life keeps getting more and more and more expensive. They keep getting empty promises, study after study, and lots of conversation. The only people getting results, Speaker, are the well-connected interests promoting private public partnerships and pooled re retirement pe registered pension plans. Why does the Premier think 
that well-connected friends should come ahead of everyday families in the province of Ontario. Well, Mr. Speaker, what I think is that the 90 per cent of small businesses that would, would benefit from having their payroll taxes reduced if we could get the Small Businesses Act passed, Mr. Speaker, I think that they would benefit and those families would benefit, Mr. Speaker. I think the families of those young people, those more than 3,000 young people who have now got placements, Mr. Speaker, are going to get experience and training. I think they are benefiting from the initiative that we put in place, Mr. Speaker. So I am sympathetic to what the minister, what the uh, leader of the third party is talking about in terms of people wondering about the future of the province. But what I know, Mr. Speaker, is that if we invest in the people and their skills and we make sure that they get the support they need, if we invest in infrastructure and if we create an environment where business can thrive, then we will have that future that Ontario needs, Mr. Speaker. And we have to do that in a coherent way, Mr. Speaker, not yes, jumping sir. on every populist bandwagon that comes along. We need a plan. We're the party that's got that plan, Mr. Speaker. Question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. The economic assumptions uh, which you've based the province's finances on have gotten significantly worse. Despite a weaker economy and a Bank of Canada stating you won't hit your growth targets, you insist that revenue will be nearly identical to your budget projections. This leaves us to conclude the government is hiding from the truth because these figures clearly demonstrate the province is not on track to balance the budget by 2017. It's obvious this government does not understand the size and scope of the problem they've created. Speaker. Premier, will you tell us the truth? What is the real effect of the slowing economy on the government's revenue, spending and debt projections for the next three years? Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear in our final economic update of the concerns that we all share around the world. In fact, our measures and our calculations are even more cautious than that of independent economists who made their projections. Ours was even more cautious than that. Exactly. So we're taking a cautious measure. And we're taking measures and discipline to control our spending. In fact, we cut our spending even last quarter as a result of declining revenues felt around the world. We are the only government in over a decade and anywhere in Canada who actually cut spending year over year. We're the only government that introduced financial transparency to ensure the integrity of those numbers, and they were audited, Mr. Speaker. So the member opposite can stand and say what he wishes. We are going to continue to invest in our people of Ontario. We're going to continue to invest in our businesses, and we look to you to support small businesses by passing the act so that we can get on with the business of helping them as well. Speaker, uh, Premier, you announced you will embark on a massive second round of stimulus spending, which apparently will have no effect on the government's deficit targets. And very telling, you refuse to provide a three-year spending and revenue outlook traditionally included in the fall economic statement. This hides the impact of a weaker economy, which the Bank of Canada said to expect, and increased spending, which you just announced. So it's obvious to us that you don't understand the size and scope of the problem you created. Order. Premier, why did you deviate from the normal practice of including this information in the fall economic statement? What is it you don't want us to know? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we have displayed and identified all of the particulars in our fall economic statement. The member talks about a precedent that has also been established because in all cases, even when they were in power, they never took the, the steps to go beyond their navel-gazing. The member opposite, my critic, can't get past his yellow tie. He's got to recognize we've got to take long term. We've got to ensure that we look beyond the immediate, and that means investing in those in particulars that stimulate growth. The member must know that across the board cuts, a slash and burn policy will hurt our economic sensitive recovery. And as well, we cannot be reckless in our spending. We're doing both, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposites have to understand that we have to invest in our future yeah, to ensure that we afford the debt that we have by measuring our net debt to GDP ratio, which is under control as well, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to stay on track to balance by 2007. New question. The member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, through you to the Premier, Premier, your Liberal government 
keeps talking about local food, but yet stands idly by as processing facilities shut their door and devastate communities. The Heinz plant in Leamington announcement that it was shutting its doors after 103 years will leave 740 people unemployed. It will have severe consequences for the entire region. It will also leave 46 tomato growers without contracts to sell their products. Has the Premier at any point met with the Heinz plant to discuss ways that the plant could remain operational and save these jobs in Leamington? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I said in answer to another question, um, we did the opposite of standing idly by, Mr. Speaker. We were very involved. We, call, we call, talked to uh, executives in the states, executives here in Canada, Mr. Speaker. I talked with the, Mitter, the, the Minister of Agriculture federally, Mr. Speaker, on the issue around packaging. So, Mr. Speaker, we did everything we could, and we will work with we will work with people in the community, Mr. Speaker, to the best of our ability to make sure that a those people people find their way back into the economy, they find their way back into jobs, and to work to make sure that if there is a possibility, Mr. Speaker, that that plant can be transformed or whatever the options are, that we explore those because it is absolutely critical. On the other hand, Mr. Speaker, we have to make sure that we continue to draw business to the province. That is the future. That is Answer. what we need to make sure happens in the, in the coming days. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. For the record, the NDP warned the government and urged them to stop the Heinz shutdown in March and again in the summer. We urged the Premier to come up with a plan to save jobs and food processing in Leamington. This government's solution to job creation is to write a letter to the federal government and let them figure it out. 700 jobs and almost 350 seasonal workers will be left out in the cold in southwestern Ontario. The food packaging regulation change issue was raised long ago. Has this Premier done anything else besides mentioning this issue to the federal government? Premier. Mr. Speaker, as I said, I had conversations with executives in Heinz a number of times over the past months, Mr. Speaker. Starting in September, I spoke with uh, the managing director for Heinz Canada. So, Mr. Speaker, we absolutely did that work. The fact is that the leader, the uh, the third party, thinks that they can control the private sector. That's not how it works, Mr. Speaker. In fact. We are facilitators of those, uh, those initiatives, Mr. Speaker. So let me talk about some of the major international investments of food processing in Ontario. Natra, a confectionery food processor based in Spade, is establishing a manufacturing facility in London. Ferrero, confectionery plant in Bradford, 385 Brantford, Brantford, $385 million over the last five years, Mr. Speaker. Uh, pet food plant in Puslinch, uh, Royal Canaan, $73 million, Mr. Speaker. A baking ingredient plant. Paratos from Belgium, Answer. Mississauga, $40 million, Mr. Speaker. It pains me that Heinz is closing. We did everything we could to intercept that, Mr. Speaker. We will work with the people in Thank the community, you. and there are jobs coming to this, country, this province. Mr. Speaker. From, uh, Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Our government has an economic plan for investing in people, building modern infrastructure, and supporting a dynamic an innovative business climate that drives economic growth and creates jobs for Ontarians. As the hardworking people of my riding in Glengarry, Prescott, Russell, and across Ontario know well, small businesses must be central to this plan if we're to ensure a strong and prosperous economy. That's why our government has put forward the Supporting Small Businesses Act to cut taxes and remove burdensome red tape from Ontario's small business. Could the minister please update this House on the progress of the legislation and our plan to cut payroll taxes for Ontario's small businesses? Very good. Thank you. Very minister good. Finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member of Glengarry Prescott Russell for the question, recognizing that small businesses are central to our government's economic plan. It's why we introduced Bill 105, which will cut taxes for 60,000 small businesses and eliminate tax altogether for 90 percent of small businesses in this province. This legislation is exactly what we need to help drive the economy forward, help small business, and create new jobs. Since it was introduced, my colleagues across the aisle have stood in their place and demanded this government bring forward job legislation and an economic plan. We did, and it includes this bill. 
but members of the opposition continue to stall these tax cuts for small business. Mr. Speaker, they voted down a motion to advance this legislation in committee, and they continue to hold it up despite calls from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business for it to be returned for third reading. Mr. Speaker, it's time for the opposition to quit talking Answer. and start acting. We need to vote on this bill before the House rises. We need to pass this legislation Thank you. now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the update. It's disappointing to hear that we're unable to find some common ground on doing the right thing for the economy and also the right thing for our small businesses here in Ontario. Could the Minister please inform the House as to the consequences of continued stall tactics on the part of the opposition? Good question. Speaker, there are roughly 400,000 small and mid-sized businesses in Ontario. By eliminating a payroll tax on 90 per cent of these small businesses, we can continue to ensure our business climate is competitive and strong and maintain Ontario's competitiveness as one of the most best places in the province, in the country, in North America to do business. And if we don't see this legislation passed before the holiday break, we won't be able to put these tax cuts in place for Ontario's small businesses. If we don't act now, Ontario small business will pay higher taxes on February 15, 2014, and then again on March 15, 2014, and then again the next month, and so on. It begs the question, why would then the opposition continue to stall this essential legislation? Because, Mr. Speaker, they're more interested in scoring cheap political points than they are supporting our small businesses. Mr. Answer. Speaker, I hope they can see past their short-term thinking and send the Bill 105 back to the House for third reading so that we can all support small businesses in Ontario. Question. The member from Barrie. We're about to find out why. Thank you, Speaker. Now we're going to find out why. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Speaker, the only thing open and transparent about this government is their obvious cheap political gaming. So far, this government has done nothing but Bill 105 to General Government Committee, whose legislative agenda they know is full, as opposed to one that is free. There can only be one explanation for this, Speaker. This government is scared and trying to skirt responsibility for the Pan Am Games. That's right. Can the minister stand and tell us why they're playing games and using bills to block Pan Am accountability investigations? That's a good question. Minister of Finance. To the House Leader, Mr. Speaker. The House Leader. Mr. Speaker, let's correct the record. Bill on unpaid interest. Mr. Speaker, on November 4th, November 4th of this year, several weeks ago, a motion was put forward by the government to look at Bill 105. It was defeated by the combined forces of the opposition party, who then came forward with a Pan Am bill. We are in the process of talking about how we can do both. We can deal with 105, which is an important matter, and at the same time deal with the Pan Am game. Yet, Mr. Speaker, despite all they're saying here, they have shown no interest to deal with 105. Our government's position is very clear, Mr. Speaker. If they, if they want to look in the Pan Am, game, Pan Am game situation, we are very happy to cooperate. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we are asking that time be allotted to Bill 105. Do supplementary. Nobody trusts these guys. Speaker, uh, there are clearly other committees that are open and can handle this, uh, this bill. This government's acting like it's afraid of the truth for a change. We need to know what's so bad about Pan Am planning that they're willing to sacrifice a very worthy Bill 105 instead of allowing an investigation in the Pan Am Games to go forward. And it has to be bad. It has to be bad, Speaker. We've already discovered four extra budgets at a total of $1.1 billion. Another billion no dollars yet on the cost of security or transportation. Sacrificing Bill 105 won't save you, Minister. Your government may not be able to handle the truth, but the people of Ontario deserve to know. Speaker, will the minister come clean, stop worrying about other members' wardrobe, and actually tell us what the cost of the panic is? Seated. Yes. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the, the, member, the member is quite frankly wrong. On November 4th, when we moved a motion to have the committee look into Bill 105, there was no other business before the committee. The opposition voted against it and then came forward with the Pan Am suggestion. Mr. Speaker, the government members are pleased to go ahead with an examination of the Pan Am Games and also auto insurance. All we are asking, Mr. Speaker, is that an allotted period of time be given to Bill 105. 
This afternoon at the committee, the government members will bring forward a motion which will allow all three, all three, Mr. Speaker, to go forward. The member and from Mr. Cambridge, Speaker, come to I order. I am looking forward to members of the opposition to put their money where their mouth is and support that motion so that we can look at both auto insurance, the Pan Am Games, and make sure Bill 105 is looked at by the committee and hopefully reported back to this yeah. legislature. Thank you. Your question, the member from Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is to the uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Good morning, Minister. After weeks of outrage and outcry from Windsor-Essex residents and persistent pressure from NDP MPPs, especially my colleague from Essex, this government has finally reversed its wrong-headed decision to cut thoracic surgeries in our community. Speaker, some of us remember well a former Conservative Education Minister who was caught on video saying, let's manufacture a crisis, create a crisis, and then we'll look good when we resolve it. Does the minister think it's right that our MPP from Windsor West is taking credit for evading a crisis that was manufactured by her own party? Well, um, good morning, Speaker, and good morning to the member opposite. Uh, Speaker, I, this is good news for Windsor. Uh, I think really what the member was saying is uh, this is good news for Windsor. Thank you, Minister, for making this decision. Uh, Speaker, I know how important this issue has been for the people of Windsor, and I can tell you that the member from Windsor West has been very, very thoughtful in her approach to this issue. She and I both have enormous respect for Cancer Care Ontario. Cancer Care Ontario is a global leading organization when it comes to providing highest quality of care for cancer patients. Speaker. They are doing an exceptional job. The unique circumstances in Windsor, Speaker, brought to my attention by the member from Windsor West, made me realize that this issue was one we had to deal with a little bit differently, Speaker. Answer. So I'm pleased that uh, the member opposite is happy with this decision, and I accept his, uh, his uh, um, support for this decision. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the residents of Windsor-Essex are happy that their health care is going to be preserved. It was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. But the question remains about the government's lack of consultation with the local hospitals and the needless anxiety that patients have been put through. This morning, the member from Windsor-Essex was happily taking credit for the decision. Can the minister explain why this government took my residents down this path in the first place? Thank you. This was Speaker, the, the member opposite has a conspiracy theory going here, Speaker, that uh, is a bit absurd to say the least. What I can tell you is that Cancer Care Ontario is making real change to the way we deliver cancer. In fact, as a result of the excellent work Cancer Care Ontario has done, uh, the, the, the deaths after uh, thoracic surgery have been cut in half. That is a significant improvement in Absolutely. quality, Speaker, that benefit all Ontarians. The circumstances in Windsor were unique. The member from Windsor West worked very hard. She did her homework. She made a reasoned, articulate um, argument, Speaker, uh, that Thank this you. was a decision that, uh, uh, that did not serve the people of Windsor, and that's why we've made the decision we have. Thank you. Question, the member from Ottawa, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, and it deals with the same subject. In Ottawa, we expect the best health care, as do each and every person living in Ontario, and we need to ensure that access to all kinds of health services are available in all regions of the province. We have had uh, residents in Windsor the express concern regarding the thoracic cancer will no longer be available at the Windsor Regional Hospital, and they might have to commute long distances, such as to London and other centres, for this specific treatment. My question for the Minister and to, to, to further elaborate on uh, uh, what she has done to ensure cancer patients in Windsor can continue to receive the services they need. You, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, uh, thank you, and I'd like to thank the, uh, the member from Ottawa, Orleans, who is a relentless advocate for improving health care in his community and across the province. Speaker, 
He has raised an issue of great importance to the people of Windsor. Uh, last week, the uh, member from Windsor, w Windsor West wrote to me. She outlined a clearly uh, uh, articulated, thoughtful argument as to why uh, uh, services should remain in Windsor. Speaker, we have had many meetings on this issue, many conversations on this issue. Uh, speaker, I've also heard from Cancer Care Ontario the rationale behind their original decision, but it was, became clear to me, Speaker, that uh, the, the, the thoracic cancer surgery in Windsor has a very strong record. It has very high quality. I have been convinced, Speaker, that Windsor should be designated a level two cancer. thoracic cancer uh, surgery, and that is, in fact, the decision that has been conveyed to Cancer Care yeah, Ontario. Yeah. Here, supplementary. Well, this is great news for the people of Windsor. And um, I can recall when we got the good news that the Mofort Hospital was going to remain open when it was closed by the Harris government in the 90s. Oh, and, really certainly, really uh, and certainly at Chio, we had the same, uh, same issue at Chio when the heart, uh, heart uh, section was to be moved from Ottawa and we were able to keep it there. And Chio is a wonderful organization and doing well in our capital. So it's good to see that our governments are making the tough decisions needed to ensure that our health care system thrives and that all Ontarians have access to services closer to where they live. Cancer patients in Windsor and Ottawa and all across this province deserve nothing but the very best of care. Speaker, can the minister further tell us why she is keeping the cancer treatment program going in, in Windsor area? Thank you, Minister. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker. And I think this is a very good example of an MPP doing their work. The member from Windsor West met with people in Windsor, understood the issue thoroughly, presented uh, some arguments as to why this was a decision that had to be changed. Speaker, I commend the member from Windsor West and from and other members uh, from all sides of this House who take the time to do their homework, who, uh, who really do um, think uh, um, sincerely and uh, thoughtfully about issues that reflect uh, the, the concerns of their residents. Speaker, this is a victory for, um, for an MPP doing her work and changing government decisions. Thank you. Question the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Minister, it's been almost three weeks since you first met with Kim Fletcher, and she still doesn't have an answer. In September 2009, the Ombudsman released his report, A Vast Injustice, which looked at the cap for a vast in treatments for those with colorectal cancer. In his report, he stated that the government must fund Avastin for increased patient survival. As you know, Minister, the effects of using Avastin for colorectal cancer and for glioblastoma multiform brain cancer are the same in both scenarios. In both cases, Avastin simply prolongs the patient's life. So, Minister, why is Avastin funded for colorectal cancer and not for brain cancer? Uh, speaker, this legislature made a determination several years ago to take the politics out of making decisions about what drugs would be covered for what conditions. I respect the will of the legislature on that issue, Speaker, and I and and I am committed to uh, to maintaining the integrity of our evidence-based decision-making process when it comes to funding cancer drugs. Quite simply, Speaker. The, uh, the evidence does not support uh, Avastin for brain cancer. Speaker, the Committee to Evaluate Drugs will always review new evidence, always review new evidence. If there is evidence that supports this improves outcome, Speaker, then the Committee to Evaluate Drugs will do their work. So I think it's unfortunate that uh, the member opposite Answer. does not respect the evidence clearly articulated by the Committee to Evaluate Drugs and by Health Canada. And I think it's very important to note this is not Ontario, it is Health Canada. At Thank you. Senior Police, supplementary. Well, I, I think it might be helpful to go back to 2009 and refresh the minister's memory, because in November, two th November 29, 2009, you announced that your ministry would fund Avastin for colorectal cancer. But this announcement came after the former member from Burlington brought awareness to this issue, resulting in an ombudsman's report. Minister, you stood in this House three weeks ago and said you would be breaking the law to fund Avastin for brain cancer because the Committee to Evaluate Drugs hadn't approved it. Yet, the Committee did not approve Avastin for colorectal cancer in 2009, but somehow you found a way to approve it. Minister, clearly you have the ability 
to approve Avastin for brain cancer in the same way you did for colorectal cancer. Will you stand here today and promise Kim Fletcher and the other patients with cancer across the country? Question. Thank you. You see the case? You see the case? Thank you, Minister of Health. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker. And I, I guess my question back is: Are you suggesting we ignore the evidence? Uh, the member opposite knows as well as every member in, in this House knows that there are demands in our health care system that, uh, that need to be Durham. funded, Speaker. So, so, so we, must, we must rely on evidence. The evidence is clear. The evidence to date is clear that outcomes do not improve with Avastin for this particular condition, Speaker. So I would like to know from the member opposite. Does she want to bring politics back in decisions around, uh, around a drug, uh, a drug coverage, Speaker? Is she asking for one person to receive exceptional coverage, Speaker? What is she asking for? I think it's up to the, the member opposite to be clear about what their policy is Answer. on this particular issue. Thank you. New question. Mayor of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Liberal promises come and go in Thunder Bay, just like the fall leaves. Election season must be getting close as the government's promising for the third time to convert the Thunder Bay generating station after cancelling the project twice at a cost of $20 million. Not only does this latest promise smack of opportunism, but it is a short-term fix that won't meet the future energy demands of mining projects in the region. When will this government stop playing politics with the energy needs of the Northwest? Mr. Energy. Mr. Speaker, we have deliberated on this issue, notwithstanding the harassment from the uh, leader of the third party, and we have, we, have, we have consulted with the people of Thunder Bay. We took our time, we were thoughtful, we looked at technical solutions, and we provided the best solution that was available for Thunder Better Bay. Than that cast the, Hamilton. The, uh, the plant is going to continue operating with advanced biomass, Mr. Speaker. She may be concerned that it's limited for five years, but we will assess the demand in the area uh, as we proceed. And if we have to add another unit and extend the time period, Mr. Speaker, we will. We have had very positive response from the stakeholders and the community. Uh, the mayor of Thunder Bay has said he's 75 Thanks, percent sir. happy with this decision, and that's wow. very good for him. Thank you. Speaker, the Common Voice Northwest Energy Task Force has called the government's latest plan to convert the Thunder Bay Generating Station to advanced biomass half a loaf. That's because running the station at a fraction of its capacity is what's in, uh, in play here, and actually running it only for a few days per year doesn't give the region a sustainable energy plan for the long term. Instead of focusing on a short-term bid to save some Liberal seats, when will this government finally listen to local Minister voices of the and get serious about the future energy needs of the Northwest? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I've been informed by two excellent MPPs from Thunder Bay. They have been in touch with their community. They have been in touch with our ministry. They have been working with their community. The we ground. have been working with their community. Mr. Speaker, we came up with a responsible decision for Thunder Bay. They will have energy when they need it. They'll have electricity when they need it, Mr. Speaker, for now and for the future. That commitment is there. We've proven it by our actions, and we will continue to respect the needs and the electricity demands in Thunder Bay, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Good question. The member from Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is for the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. The Accessibility Directorate is now under the purview of the Minister's Ministry because our government is committed to ensuring that individuals with disabilities have equal access to job opportunities and economic security. As part of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, businesses must comply with the customer service standard. As well, businesses and not-for-profits with more than 20 staff must file a compliance report. Speaker, can the minister please update the House about how the customer service standard uh, is being enforced? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ottawa South for this uh, important question. Mr. Speaker, all Ontario businesses and not-for-profits must be compliant with the customer service standard under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act. 
This is the law, Mr. Speaker. And as the minister responsible for the AODA across government, I take this issue very, very seriously. Not enough businesses have complied with the customer service standard. And, Mr. Speaker, this is unacceptable. It is their legal responsibility to comply. My goal as the minister responsible is to enforce this law until we reach full compliance. And over the next two weeks, we will be sending warning notices to businesses that have failed thus far to file compliance reports and failure to comply fail to file mr speaker will result in penalties yes, thank you thank you supplementary uh, thank you mr speaker thank you minister for the update it's important that all ontario businesses are compliant with the customer service standard adhering to the standards of the accessibility for ontarians with disability act is also important to our economy one in seven people in our province has a disability and that number is expected to increase substantially as our population ages. That, this represents a significant portion of our workforce. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please update this House about your ministry's plan to improve the percentage of organizations that have filed their compliance service standard reports? Thank you, Minister. Thank you again. And uh, of course, our government is committed to building a dynamic and innovative business climate, one where every Ontarian can work in a safe and accessible environment. Ontario can proudly boast that it's one of the first places in the world to make accessibility a law. So to increase the number of organizations that have filed their customer service standard compliance report, we will work with the Accessibility Directorate of Ontario to promote the customer service standard and find those organizations that, after multiple warnings, I repeat, multiple yeah. warnings, have not yet complied. Yeah. Ontario is poised to be a global leader in this sector. It's a human right that our province can't <coughs> afford to ignore, and it makes great business sense Absolutely. as well. And as the Jobs Minister, I will use my portfolio to engage the business community right across the province to promote Answer. their awareness of the Customer Service Standard Act. And I'd like to call on all, all members of this legislature to support me in doing that. Thank you. New question, the member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Speaker, my, uh, my question is to the Premier. Premier, since your government came into power in 2003, my riding has lost over 10,000 manufacturing jobs. Your words tell us you are creating jobs but I question where. Last week, H.J. Hines, the plant in Leamington, announced that it would be closing after 104 years, resulting in the loss of over 1,000 jobs, affecting their entire supply chain, and lost contracts for 46 tomato farmers who have up to $2 million tied up in equipment. The economic impact to Leamington, Premier, is devastating. Premier, you clearly stated this morning that you knew about this in September, but you failed to let anyone know. You didn't make a statement the day of the Question. closure announcement because you were too busy dealing with the City of Toronto's issues. So, Premier, the people in my riding of Chatham, Ken Essex, need answers you. now. So, my thank you. Seated, please. You finish. Let's talk faster. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the uh, Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment is going to want to uh, speak to the, uh, to the, the supplementary. But, Mr. Speaker, to the, to the question of where are jobs being created, Mr. Speaker, let me name the places. London, Brantford, Puslinch, Mississauga, Brantford again, London, Wheatley, Mr. Speaker. There are food processing plants, Mr. Speaker. There are manufacturing plants that are expanding, that are being developed across the province, Mr. Speaker. I am very sorry and disappointed that the Heinz plant is being closed, Mr. Speaker. But it is not about just this plant. The Heinz company in general, Mr. Speaker, is making decisions across all of their operations. I spoke with the executives in Sir. the States, the executives in Canada, Mr. Speaker, and of course I didn't talk about what those conversations were about because those were confidential interactions, Mr. Speaker. My minister Thank said you. the day the announcement was made, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. New uh, supplementary, the member from Oxford. With agriculture, too. Minister, during our survey last year, food manufacturers told us their biggest challenges are the result of your government. Heinz was one of the 75% that said red tape is increasing, 
and we heard about the high cost of doing business in Ontario, especially the spiraling cost of hydro. We told you all that last year, Minister. You knew the Heinz plant was closed, the closure was coming, and the only thing you did was issue a press release about container size deregulation, trying to blame the federal government. Yep. For the closure, the federal minister told you clearly they are not proceeding with the changes because it would cost jobs. No, Mr. Minister, he told you in those conversations. Since you knew, since you knew the container size question, since, since you knew the container size regulations were changing, why did you issue that release you. the day before the closure? Thank you. <laughs> Order. Uh, the member from Durham can play musical chairs all he wants, but I can still recognize his voice. And the member from Lambton, Kent Middlesex, will come to order as well. Minister of Agriculture and Food. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is not true, Mr. Speaker, that we knew made that decision on packaging before the announcement at Heinz was made, Mr. Speaker. It is just not true. And in my conversations with the federal minister, there was no commitment that they would change their rules on the packaging, Mr. Speaker. There was no commitment that they would not make that change. There was uh, very much a dissembling on that issue, Mr. Speaker. So it is absolutely not true that that Order. decision had been made. We reached out, Mr. Speaker. We reached out to the company, Mr. Speaker. We have an open for business table where we are changing regulation. And I really think that my critic knows, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows that we are working with the food processing. All I'm going to tell you, and that's enough. Finish, please. We are working with the food processing sector, and as a result of the open for business table, regulations are being changed, Mr. Speaker, Answer. so that their businesses can flourish. He knows that, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I know that he would like to continue to work Thank with you. us on those issues. Good question, the member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. The District School Board of Niagara has called upon the Education Minister and the Premier to visit the school board in hopes for some action on a decade-long underfunding, chronic underfunding problem of special education from the province. The school board estimates that they are being underfunded to the tune of $9 million a year, $90 million over the last decade. Why did this government waste over a billion dollars on saving Liberal seats during the last election while ignoring the needs of special education students in the Niagara region? Thank you, Minister of Education. Yes, um, and uh, I, I think that we need to understand that there's just one particular component of the special education funding model that the Niagara District School Board is concerned about. In fact, uh, the, the Niagara District School Board gets exactly the same per pupil funding as other school boards on virtually every component. The high needs uh, component is based on uh, documentation uh, around the, uh, the the incidence of high needs kids. It uh, that's something that uh, was introduced by the Tories. Something that school boards complained wasn't necessarily a satisfactory way of getting at it. We got it, got uh, rid of that, and we actually do have a model in place that is gradually correcting that uh, that issue. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister. Back to the minister. Well, you've had 10 years to actually fix it. The District <laughs> School Board of Niagara receives only $355 per student in high needs funding. The average provincial school board receives $636 per student. So why do special education needs students in Niagara receive just over half of the funding that special education students receive in other regions of this province. When and will this be fixed? 
Minister of Education. Yes, and as I as I just explained, that amount is actually based on documentation, which the Niagara District School Board has historically submitted to the Ministry of Education, and we do have a program to uh, to uh, look at phasing that to a different level. However, I think what is uh, perhaps more relevant here today, Speaker, is we've just begun today uh, a review of the complete funding model, and we are working with school board stakeholders all over the province, Speaker, to review the uh, school board funding model and to look at ways where it needs to be updated, areas where it can be made more effective to ensure that, in fact, we are providing the best possible support to school boards and to children all over the province. Your question, the member from Gilbert. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment. Protecting the quality of the air we breathe is a fundamental concern for both the people in my riding of scarborough guildwood and for Ontarians more generally. It affects their health and our health care costs. Both the federal government and the United Nations have recently issued reports that suggest Canada is not on track in meeting its commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 17 per cent from 2005 levels by 2020. Air pollution has proven to have negative effects on health and can cause premature death. It is important that this nationwide trend is not the case in our province of Ontario, especially for our youngest residents. Speaker, through you, would the Minister of Environment please share with this House what progress our Russia. government has made towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions in Ontario? Minister of the Environment. Well, an excellent question from the member. Uh, we strongly believe in uh, improving air quality for the well-being of our residents. Our Green Energy Act continues to bring Ontario emission-free electricity and new clean jobs. Ontario's dedicated commitment to phase out coal-fired electricity by the end of 2014 has successfully reduced emissions in the electricity sector by 57 per cent. Now, and finally, in November 1, 2013, the Ministry of the Environment has posted a proposal on the environmental and regulatory registries to consult with stakeholders on a provincial mandate for greener diesel fuels, and that would include, of course, uh, uh, green diesel, which is safe, non-toxic, clean-burning, biodegradable, and renewable fuel. Sir. To ensure that tangible economic and environmental benefits are achieved, the proposed approach includes an average greenhouse gas reduction requirement for fuel bombs sold thank you. and used in the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. It is reassuring to hear that our government has taken steps towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions in Ontario. The community of Scarborough Guildwood is lucky to have a local biofuels company, Pond Biofuels, working towards reducing greenhouse gas, gas emissions with investments from our government. The 2013 budget announced that Ontario will take steps to update its green transportation fuels policy by consulting with stakeholders on a provincial mandate for greener diesel fuels, including discussions related to the amount of renewable fuel content as well as greenhouse gas requirements. I am pleased that the Ministry, Minister of Environment is delivering on this government's commitment to consult with stakeholders on greener diesel fuels through November, the November 1st proposal which you mentioned. Speaker, through you, could the Minister of the Environment please share with this House further Question. details on the proposed greener diesel field regulations and how this will affect the air we breathe? Thank you. Mr. This, uh, first of all, is that part of that commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve air quality. The Ministry proposed that regulation, and it's going to require that Ontario's diesel pool contain a minimum percentage of diesel made from renewable sources. The proposal is expected to provide air quality benefits, including reduced particulate matter and greenhouse gas reductions. It is estimated that the greener diesel requirement will reduce Ontario's GHG emissions by approximately 200,000 tonnes per year in the first compliance period. 1 million tons wow. annually from 2017 onwards Four. and Answer. about 5 million tons on a cumulative basis by 2020. 
there are a series of uh, initiatives being taken to improve air quality, Thank you. and I think the people of this province will support that. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Chatham-Kent-Essex has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Premier concerning the closure of Heinz Plant in Leamington. The matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. In the uh, Members' West Gallery, we do have a visitor for, who represented Burlington South in the 34th, 33rd, 34th, 35th, 36th, and Burlington in the 37th and 38th Parliaments, Mr. Cam Jackson. Welcome, Cam. Also in the Speaker's Gallery, we have a visitor, a former MP of Haldeman Norfolk, Mr. Bob Speller. Welcome, Bob. There are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.